Children learn in school that George Washington's false teeth were made of wood. That is not true. Some of his dentures were made of ivory and metal, but some of them came from the human beings he owned. Washington became a slave owner at the age of 11 upon his father's death. He increased his wealth in 1759 when he married Martha Custis, a widow who had nearly 300 slaves, of which more than 80 were dower slaves, meaning they were granted to her upon her husband's death, while the remainder were in her custody until their minor son came of age to own them legally, while Washington had approximately 50. When Washington's dentures became ill-fitting and painful, he chose to get teeth from the people he owned. Records show that they were paid 122 shillings for nine teeth, less than a third the going rate at the time. Washington told a friend, quote, I confess I have been staggered in my belief in the efficacy of transplantation, end quote. The payment didn't diminish the terror for the chattel. The fact that Washington owned other people at all was a crime, and a grievous one at that. But the, quote, father of our country, end quote, didn't see things that way because he did not see black people as fully human, endowed with unalienable rights, and so he did everything in his power to maintain his hold on his living, breathing capital. His story, Sanitized for Elementary School Children, is a fundamental example of the lies told about our nation's history that keeps Americans ignorant of the truth and how it affects them today. The first capital of the United States was New York City, where Washington was sworn into office in 1789. The Residence Act passed in 1790 mandated that the capital be temporarily moved to Philadelphia for a period of 10 years before being permanently established along the Potomac River by 1800. From the start, northern politicians were held hostage by the southern plantation economy. Southerners insisted that the capital be located in a place that was decidedly dependent on the planter economy. The creation of a new capital city was an enormous victory for the slaveholding class. Their peculiar institution was granted physical protection and the imprimatur of a government built to ensure its survival. A central political principle in the early days of this country was the maintenance and protection of the slavery system. However, anyone who believes in American superiority is expected to omit or at least downplay this fact to maintain the illusion of democracy and beneficence. Even the ten years of governance in Philadelphia proved to be problematic. A 1780 Pennsylvania law guaranteed enslaved people the right to seek their freedom if they remained in the state for more than six months. They could have put Washington in a bind, but he had a solution. He rotated his human property for six-month intervals between Pennsylvania and Virginia. He did this in flagrant violation of a 1788 amendment to this law, which prohibited such actions. In 1791, Washington started by rotating nine people, including a dower slave named Ona Maria One, judge. In a letter to his secretary, Tobias Lear, Washington mused on the slave's potential access to freedom. At any rate, it might, if they conceived they had a right to make it, make them insolent in a state of slavery. As all excerpt Hercules and Paris are dower Negroes, it behooves me to prevent the emancipation of them, otherwise I shall not only lose the use of them, but may have them to pay for. If upon taking good advice it is found expedient to send them back to Virginia, I wish to have it accomplished under pretexts that may deceive both them and the public. End quote. Washington was serious about denying any opportunity for freedom. On a judge recalled her escape in an 1845 interview. Quote, Whilst they were packing up to go to Virginia, I was packing to go. I didn't know where, for I knew that if I went back to Virginia, 
I should never get my liberty. I had friends among the colored people of Philadelphia, had my things carried there beforehand, and left Washington's house while they were eating dinner." Oney managed to flee to New Hampshire in 1796, but she still was not safe. The fugitive slave clause in the Constitution allowed for her to be returned to bondage, and the Washingtons tried incessantly to get her back. With more than 300 human beings among their collective property, the escape of even one might put their entire enterprise on shaky ground. A friend of the Washingtons saw Judge in New Hampshire and informed them. The President wrote a letter to his Secretary of the Treasury, Oliver Woolcott, demanding his assistance in getting Judge back. Quote, I am sorry to give you or anyone else trouble on such a trifling occasion, but the ingratitude of the girl, who was brought up and treated more like a child than a servant, and Mrs. Washington's desire to recover her, ought not to escape with impunity if it can be avoided." End quote. Washington sent intermediaries to try to trick Judge into returning with promises of freedom. Those promises were lies as a dower slave. She could not have been freed without compensation given to the Custis estate and the Washington's determination to recapture her is an indication that they were unlikely to even contemplate such an effort. She avoided the attempts to entrap her and remain a free woman for the rest of her life. Not only did Washington not allow any of his slaves to go free, but he also did not countenance other white people doing things that might lessen his hold on this property. Sally Green was the abandoned wife of an overseer on Washington's Mount Vernon estate. When Washington learned in 1794 that she planned to open a small store in Alexandria, he was not pleased and he wrote to his manager, William Pierce, quote, Caution Sally Green against dealing with my Negroes after she is fixed in Alexandria. If she deals with them at all, she will be unable to distinguish between stolen or not stolen things, and if her conduct should lay her open to suspicion, she need expect no further countenance or support from me, end quote. The great irony exists in the fact that Washington is now the, quote, blackest, end quote, surname in the United States. Ninety percent of the Washingtons in America are black people. It is not clear how many of them may be descended from Washington or the enslaved people on his estate. Booker T. Washington claimed to have chosen the name randomly when he was a child. Most of the ancestors of today's Washingtons probably chose the name as a way of identifying themselves with their country, a major irony in the face of what black people have had to contend with throughout the country's history. George Washington would express some reservations about slavery, exclaiming at one point that he wanted, quote, to be quit of Negroes, end quote, yet he never freed any in his lifetime. He did not have the right to free Martha's dower slaves or those who belonged to the estate of her first husband, Daniel Park Curtis. But in his will, he did agree to free those he owned after Martha's death. This left his widow Martha afraid that she could be killed by people who would gain their freedom if she died. Abigail Adams said as much after a visit with her in 1800, quote, in the state in which they were left by the general, to be free at her death, she did not feel as though her life was safe in their hands, many of whom would be told that it was their interest to get rid of her. She therefore was advised to set all free at the close of the year. Martha decided to manumit or free the slaves belonging to her late second husband, George Washington. But her dower slaves, those she received from her first husband's estate, never gained their freedom. Upon her death, they were dispersed among her grandchildren, splitting up numerous families in the process. Washington was followed in the office of president by 11 other slaveholding men, seven of whom owned slaves even while holding that office. Their slave ownership was not incidental to their achieving the highest office in the land, but was inextricably linked to that fact. Slaveholding was profitable, and it is logical that the elite classes of that time would be represented in presidential contests. The United States was committed to maintaining this institution, and whether northern or southern, 
No president considered ending the practice until Abraham Lincoln was forced to confront the matter in 1861.